start off the video with welcome to the bald head and no budget IT channel. <laughs> talking before the camera man hey guys welcome back to the channel today i'm going to go over the basics no no we're not because i couldn't keep my mouth shut and so we're going to take some detailed steps into your home network how things are connected together we're going to get into ip addressing but i did not cover vlans on this video that's going to be the next video because it's a rabbit hole of its own so sit back relax and enjoy the video Give me feedback on what I did well and what else you want to hear that I didn't dive into. Or if there's something you want to know more about that I didn't go into depth enough about, tell me that as well and it lets me know what videos you guys want to see. Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's talk about what the internet actually is. And I promise you it's not a series of tubes and it's not a place where your grandma can just go shut down the spider web. The internet is made up of a series of connections of internet providers all connected together, peered and trunked so that they can communicate and pass data from one network to another. Simply put, the internet. All of that is now connected by fiber optics. High speed, ridiculously fast, um, 400, 800 gigabyte per second fiber optic cables. And it's highly redundant. It goes geographically different ways, under seas, on telephone poles, but eventually it gets to a service provider in your local area. Your internet service provider typically will have a local demarcation. This is where they either retransmit the signal or put it over a different medium type like a coaxial cable or put it over fiber optics that will get to your house, FTTH. Whatever the medium is that the internet service provider brings to your home, the next step is connecting to the modem. Your modem is gonna take in the medium, whether that's a coaxial cable, fiber, or a POTS line, and translate it into something that's usable in your own. Typically, this is gonna be an ethernet jack on your modem that is a customer service handoff. So this is gonna be where you plug your equipment in, or your router, or sometimes modems are all in one devices where they're already broadcasting Wi-Fi for you. If you wanna run your own router in your own home, the first thing that you're gonna to need to do if your modem is an all-in-one device, is turn it into bridge mode or pass-through mode. Different providers with different boxes call it different things. You're gonna to have to figure out what that is for you. Plug into the ethernet jack on your modem and then plug in your router. Having your own router is gonna let you set up your own private network or networks. This will allow you to start getting into segregation for your IoT, into having guest Wi-Fi, We'll get into that a little bit later. Typically, when your modem is in pass-through, you're gonna get a public IP address on your WAN side of your router. This is not gonna be an address that starts with a 10 dot, a 172, or a 192.168. On your router, you will typically have one or more ethernet jacks for your LAN or your local area network. This is the side where we'll be able to set up our private networks for our IoT, for our guest Wi-Fi, and this will typically be connected directly into an Ethernet switch. So now that we have the basics of a network set up, let's talk about plugging in our devices and device connectivity. From your switch, you'll typically plug in your computer, a Raspberry Pi, your wireless access point, your TV, any game systems, or any other devices that you have that you wish to plug in. When you plug these devices into this ethernet switch, they are gonna get an IP address that is the same subnet as your LAN interface. Now again, we're not talking about VLANs yet. We'll get there. Okay, let's say that the LAN interface, this one right here, has an IP address of 192.168.7.1 with a subnet of 255.255.255.0. Perfect handwriting. This is also known as a slash 24 or a 24-bit subnet because 8, 16, 24 bits. I will make another video on subnetting. So for now on, for simplicity, 
If the subnet is 255, 255, 2550, I'm going to express it as a slash 24. Again, because it's 24 bits. Okay, so your router's interface is 192.168.7.1. If your DHCP was set up automatically, or if you configured it to work with this subnet, it's very likely that your devices are going to get an IP address of 192.168.7.100 through 200 with a 24-bit subnet, a gateway of 192.168.7.1, and a DNS address of 192.168.7.1 as well. So this is the basics of having a network. Your internet, which is your modem, your connection to your router, your LAN, which is all encompassing of your network, so your switch, your devices, runs on one subnet, and that is a LAN. This is your basic subnet. If you wanna use DDWRT, if you wanna use PFSense, Vieta, Edge routers, if you wanna use Ubiquity devices, they go right here. They go in between your modem and your switch. Your router, translates your local network packets or your private address space into a public address space. This is where NAT happens. I'm sure that you've heard of NAT and if you've been around the forums well enough, you've probably asked a question that resulted in an answer saying, hey, don't do that. That's gonna result in double NAT. Very quickly, what is double NAT? This is double NAT. And this is the basic topology of a double NAT system. The problem with this topology is simply this PC will never be able to talk to this PC. This first PC is connected to the first router. The second PC is connected to the second router. The second PC might be able to talk to the first PC, but the first PC will not be able to talk to the second PC unless you make changes and do other configurations, which I'm simply not gonna get into on this video. That's a routing video. It's coming, not about the basics. Now that we've talked about why double NAT at a very basic level is bad, let's jump back into our basic topology. Mm, Cokey. <laughs> Now that I've read my reminder and we're back from intermission, let's get started. What else can I tell you about basic networking? There's a lot. And honestly, I can go about, on about tangents, about simply the cable communications between your provider and its modem, but I'm gonna try and keep this video as basic as possible. By Jove, I got it. Simplicity, let's talk about static IP addresses. Your network has a subnet. In this discussion, your subnet is this, 192.168.7, with a 24-bit subnet mask. This means that any address, 192.168.7.1 through 192.168.7.254 is a valid and usable IP address. Dot zero, while it is an IP address, is your network identifier, and 255 is your broadcast address. Again, different video, we will get into that, but those two addresses cannot be used, your first and your last. Which means any address between one and 254 can be used. Number one is already used on your router's interface. So we have two through 254 left. Personally, I always leave one through nine open for network-based devices, routers, switches, access points, because your network is built starting at the beginning, the core devices. That's just my topology preference. You can put them wherever you would like. Adding to my preferences, just because you're here listening, I start my printers at 10, and I start my static IPs for computers at 50 because that leaves me a very large chunk of open space 
for any other devices on my network. Servers, Raspberry Pis, printers, whatever. If I want to set a static IP address on my computer, this is where I would start. 192.168.7.50. Why? Because we already discussed this. I can choose any IP address in the range of 192.168.7, that's a definitive, and a number between 1 and 254. I start with 50 with my computers. Your subnet mask must be the same as the subnet mask of your subnet, and very easily, the same subnet mask on your router's interface. The gateway address is going to be the IP address of your router's local area interface. Why would I want to set a static IP address on my network? Well, if you were providing services from this PC or server or NAS or any device that's running something that you want to consistently be able to identify or access, it's a good idea to set a static IP address on it. The other way that you can do this is by doing a DHCP reservation. What this means is that you tell your router to always hand out a very specific address for a certain interface of a device based on the MAC address of that device. If this PC was running Plex, Plex listens on port 32400. That means that when any browser of a device inside of this network goes to 192.168.7.50 colon 32400, they're going to get to the web interface of Plex. This also means that any device on this network will be able to see this as well. If we want Plex to be available outside of our network, we have to do a little bit of port forwarding. When you are doing port forwarding, that takes place in the device that is holding your public IP address. In most cases, and in this setup, that's going to be your router. So you would log into your router's interface and specify that you want port 32400 on the WAN to be port forwarded to IP address 192.168.7.50 on port 32400. Let's do a 10,000 foot overview of Wi-Fi. We've already gone over the basics of your network, so we know that your network has a subnet of 192.168.7.x, x being the host identifier of your network, which is 1 through 254. We already know that 1 is already taken up by your router, and we know that other devices already have an IP address from DHCP starting at 100 through 200. With me so far? Awesome. If not, go back to the beginning of the video. Wi-Fi is simply an extension of your Ethernet cable. What does that mean? First of all, the wireless access point is a device itself on the network. Because we have to control it, configure it, and it needs to talk on the network, the access point itself gets an IP address. Remember how I said earlier that I assigned my networking devices between 2 and 9? I've assigned here my wireless access point 192.168.7.3. My bad with a subnet mask of 24 bits, 255.255.255.0. This access point is broadcasting an SSID. That is the name of your Wi-Fi. I'm being hilarious, but this isn't far off to how Wi-Fi works. Your access point broadcasts its name. It says, hey, here's my name, here's my channel, and I require a password. When your device hears the broadcast from your access point, it then shows up in the list of wireless networks on your phone. When you select that you want to connect to this network, you select the name of your network, and it then prompts you to type in a password. We are all very familiar with this process. Your phone then says, hey, I'd like to join. The access point says, okay, what's the password? Your phone then sends the password that you've put in, and you go through a negotiation between your access point and your phone. Once you have completed the wireless negotiation to the access point, you then start the ethernet negotiations. Your phone will request DHCP the same way that any device connected to a switch does. So whatever you have your router set up to hand out on DHCP for all of these devices is what 
your phone is also going to get. So your phone is going to get an IP address of what? Can you guess? I hope you guessed right. 192.168.7, somewhere randomly generated in the 100 to 200 range. That your phone got 192.168.7 dot seven dot one twenty nine slash twenty four and a gateway of dot one your phone would then be able to communicate with any other device on this network i'm going to cut off this video here this video was meant to be the absolute basics and a ten thousand foot overview of a basic network topology and i feel like we've accomplished that here but I know that you guys want to see other more in-depth videos about VLANs, switching, routers, um, Wi-Fi, and I'm going to get to all of those. I'm going to continue off of this topology so that we can make a mini-series of sorts. So stick around. Please hit that like and subscribe button so that I know you're interested in these topics, and I'll continue to make more videos, and I hope to see you soon.